working on staff with them. That's good. Well, Jerry, no program would be complete unless we started out with those early childhood years. So tonight, we're going to start with a few pictures to depict what it was like when you were just a baby. Now, no one believes you were, but we have, <laughs> we have pictures to prove it. No life would be complete without starting at the beginning, so that's where we'll start. <laughs> so we'll follow this tradition and we'll continue with the other picture. <laughs> that's where he got started taking kids to Belmont Park. One of the benefits of reviewing these early pictures is that we have the opportunity to see that famous J, uh, PJ smile. <laughs> Notice the legs. And maybe this next picture is where he got the idea of the bike hikes. Or maybe this one. Even though Jer D Jerry didn't serve in the armed forces, it wasn't because he didn't have a heart to. This is evident by these pictures. <laughs> uh, perhaps he didn't know what branch to join. <laughs> and here's an early picture with his mom and dad. He's the one in the middle. And we often wonder where Jerry got his interest in Mexico. Well, it started way back then. <laughs> now, Jerry's interest in spiritual things probably began at a very early age also because we do have evidence of him holding a Bible. It's almost, it's almost bigger than he was. And finally, one of Edie's favorite picture, where she thinks he really looked foxy, Jerry at 14. Now, Jerry, we've got a lot of other pictures, and we got all these pictures from your mother who sent them from, uh, from Texas. And we don't have time to show them to you all tonight, but you will because we put them in a photo album, and here she is to present them to you. She flew in last night to be here for tonight, and this is the first time that Jerry knew about it, and so we're excited that she's here. Glad to have you, Mrs. Coffey. From there, they um, moved. They, he grew up in Texas, but then they moved quickly to Santa Barbara, and in Santa Barbara, he decided to go to college at UCLA. When you played on the basketball team at UCLA, and after that, he was confronted at UCLA by a man who uh, confronted him with the gospel. So, see if you recognize this man's voice. Jerry, do you remember when we were chatting together about receive, your receiving Christ? You said you had some reservations. You had great plans for your life, and you were afraid that Christ may change those plans. Who is that? Bill Bright. Bill Bright. Later tonight, uh, Dr. Bright will be sharing with us later of a challenge. We're so glad that you came. He flew in uh, just last week. He was in China and then flew into Vancouver and made a special trip to be here tonight for you, Jerry. Um, now, UCLA. I'm telling you, this is the foggiest time of Jerry's life because 
we tried to figure out and put the pieces together and he would never tell us, okay? So, but we tried to figure out what, what happened in those early years and he was a rebel back then. And uh, at that time, he... Uh, at that time... Wait, wait, don't turn the light off yet. Uh, at that time, he uh, became acquainted with the staff with uh, Campus Crusade for Christ and would go out sharing on the campus and he had a very special uh, time because he was able to live at the home of um, Marietta Mears home um, there was a group of people that shared the house with her also with Dr. Bright and his wife and it was a big huge uh, house and we have a couple of pictures of those early days there's Jerry with uh, Henrietta Mears at a reception for Dr. Muma, who is now the uh, uh, spokesman with the president. And this is that little cottage they lived in. <laughs> it's 110 Stonehenge Road in Bel Air. And then these are the meetings that they would hold in those early, early days. Yes, this is up. Yes, yeah, please, Jerry, say things when you know what they are. We don't know what these all are, but you do. <laughs> I think this is uh, at uh, Forest Home. And that's the lake in the background. And that was the uh, land that Mary, uh, Henrietta bought and developed that facility. That's Bob Davenport. Bob Davenport. In the middle? Next slide. Is that it? Okay. Now, in those early years, in those early years, um, he met a very special person, a very good friend, and living at that house, uh, and she has a story to tell. Jerry, see if you remember this person. From the earliest days of Jerry's life in Christ, he was sensitive to the need for keeping a short account with God. A job that Jerry did to help around the house there at 110 Stone Canyon Road in Bel Air was to work on the lawn and to keep it beautiful in the lower garden. One Monday he was painting the sprinkler heads so that they wouldn't run over it with the lawnmower. <laughs> and as he worked with a fellow, uh, as he worked, a fellow came up to see him and, he, and they were just chatting together and Jerry um, was just kind of stroking one of the exotic plants with that paintbrush he had in his hand. Well, then he went in to get cleaned up to go to a, to, to a Campus Crusade for Christ meeting at a fraternity on campus. He was to join the team and to go to this campus meeting. And in the meantime, Miss Mears had gone down to just wander around in the garden and to enjoy it. And she was horrified to see that her beautiful plant had white stripes on it. <laughs> Well, she went back into the house and everyone knew that she wasn't too pleased about that, but she was really upset because she knew it was the little boy next door who had done this. <laughs> well, the team gathered together to have prayer before they went to UCLA, and um, Jerry joined the team, of course, and they were just ready to go after having asked the Lord to really use them in that team meeting. And Jerry said, as they left the door, he said, wait just a minute, I need to go back inside. And he went in to see Miss Mears and to settle an account with Miss Mears, telling her that he was the little boy <laughs> that painted the, to, painted the plant, but he got it squared away right away so that God can use him in the team meeting. Who is that, Jerry? Sister Graham. Dottie Graham, yes. <laughs> Now, Dottie Graham is the one that Jerry uh, gives credit to encourage him to go to Bob Jones University. And so that's, after that time at UCLA, he decided to go into the ministry and actually joined the, uh, he was in ROTC and he had to do time. And so, um, so what he was going to do was, because they paid for the college, he was going to go in as a chaplain now that he received Christ but uh, he had to get some seminary training so he went to Bob Jones University 
But before he left, one of his fraternity brothers, and we have a tape that was sent from one of his uh, good friends in those college years, and his name is Greg Barnett. Listen to this tape. This is Greg Barnett, administrator at Pine Summit Christian Conference Center in the Alps of the San Bernardino Mountains, Big Bear Lake. Wanting so much to be a part of the celebration of God's goodness both to you and through you. I go back to 34 years ago, where God used you as an instrument in my brand new Christian life. There at the campus of UCLA, I remember you forcing me to learn God's Word. <laughs> I must have over a hundred Bible verses that are still a part of my life because you made me learn those. They have done me in good stead both in their obediences as in God's promises. I recall well the time that I was to meet with you for discipleship. I wasn't well prepared. So I didn't show. But you stayed the whole time, and from a distance on a hill, I could see that you stayed. That faithfulness helped me in meeting with other people and being able to say that God cares, even if people don't respond. Thank you for caring. Thank you for your faithfulness in serving 30 years there at Scott Memorial Baptist Church. You have been an inspiration to me in helping you serve. Over 18 years here at Pine Summit. I well remember your separated life for our Lord Jesus Christ in the fraternity house there in UCLA. It stands out as an example of one who was able to stand up against the world and its values and for our Lord Jesus Christ. You became a model to all the believers at UCLA, and now, these 30 years at Scott Memorial Baptist Church of San Diego. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only at UCLA and at Scott Memorial, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Many times I don't have to say much about the gospel because they already know the gospel according to the life of Jeremiah Wright. I rejoice with you. I thank God for you. I trust you have a great evening with your friends and your family. Well, then Jerry went to Bob Jones University, and a radical on that campus can cause problems. But he met a very special young lady there, and see if you recognize this voice. And if you don't, <laughs> you're in trouble. All right. This is terrible. <laughs> Honey, do you remember when I took you home to meet my family and all my relatives? I was so proud of him. Here he was going to be a pastor, and I took him home to meet all my relatives. Now, I came, I come from a family, a very large family. Jerry happens to be an only child, and he didn't really enjoy um, meeting a lot of relatives. In fact, one Sunday afternoon, he saw the cars come up the road and we were around the dinner table and he all of a sudden took off and went upstairs to study his Bible. And my dear relatives came in and of course I wanted them to meet Jerry. And I went to call Jerry to have him come down to meet all my wonderful relatives, and ones who were lawyers and professors in the university and I really wanted this man to make a good impression. I went to call him and he wasn't there. And I came back down with kind of a puzzled look on my face and happened to look out the big picture window that was in the room and where all my in the room in which all my relatives were sitting. And there was Jerry coming down the ladder right in front of the picture window and my little brother <laughs> My little brother was holding the ladder. They thought it would be far more exciting to be out playing than sitting in meeting my relatives. Well, that was almost the end of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> Edie, we also want to say um, 
of course, I wasn't around or at least conscious when you came here. But um, I mean, I was around, I'll tell you that. Um, but, it, you know, when people say you grew on someone, you didn't grow on any of us. We loved you from the very start. You are an amazing woman. We love you. We want to show you some of your wedding pictures. And so uh, we, we just have a couple here. And here are some of those uh, early days. Aww. Same haircut. Unbelievable. And then he graduated, believe it or not. And, uh, and also, that's when Frisbees came in style. <laughs> And this is Jerry with uh, his mother, Mrs. Coffey. Great, that's when he graduated. Shortly after graduation, he came back and worked at Campus Crusade for Christ, and he was on staff there. And uh, he also got ordained at the First Baptist Church in Burbank under the direction of Dr. Martin Luther Long. And this is a picture of Dr. Long and Jerry together. So that was his ordination in 1957. Is that right? Or six? Edie didn't know these dates either. You know, when you get that old, it kind of starts to... <laughs> All right. But he came back and he worked on the Berkeley campus and he took the place of this voice. Jerry, the first time I met you and Edie was not uh, at Berkeley. It was four years earlier, 1953. I had just joined the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ the previous year and after working at the fraternities and sororities there for a year I came down to UCLA and there I met you in some Campus Crusade functions. I was so impressed with uh, the obvious uh, change that God had brought into your life and I remember uh, two incidents that uh, uh, linger in my memory. The first was I went to your fraternity house with you to meet some of the other fraternity men who had uh, found Christ. And it was obvious your, uh, the, the change in the leadership you were exerting spiritually in the fraternity. Uh, a rather interesting incident is your first disciple, as I remember, was a dog. <laughs> he was the mascot of the fraternity and I remember, if my memory serves me correctly, that he went to every class, uh, tagged you around campus, and uh, was a constant companion. The thing that impressed me spiritually about you is immediately you began to model what we were trying to do with other students. You became involved in uh, Campus Crusade activities, you began to memorize scripture, you began to, you were at, I think every Bible study, and you began to go into the other fraternities and sororities and share your faith in Jesus Christ. That summer, in August, you and I and a group of others climbed Mount Whitney together. Uh, and I remember we went in shorts and it got hot as we climbed the mountain and we stripped off our shirts and after two days on the mountain we came back and we were uh, like bright red cherries. That was 34 years ago and I have followed your ministry with uh, praise and prayer for all that God has done through you that began back there in, nine, in 34 years ago at UCLA. Who is that, Jim? Gordon Clink. Mr. Clink. I haven't. I did? Okay. That was Gordon Clink, and uh, Gordon told me that Jerry was even wearing shorts back then, and he's been wearing shorts ever since. Um, and on every trip. I remember on those times on winter camps, he'd have a huge heavy coat on and shorts. Um, <laughs> Shortly after they were married, um, they had their first child. And so if Monica and your husband, if you will come up, please. Monica and Steve. And that was in uh, July night. Wait a minute. October 5th. Oh, I put that paper down. I thought I was done with it. Uh, yes, on October 5th. Now, we're going to ask Monica a question here because... Jerry's always the one in the limelight, or, or Edie speaking, and so we want to ask some questions, okay, and find out the truth about this man, okay? First of all, Monica, can you tell me, 
what are the qualities that you admired most about your dad when you were growing up? I think you need to speak into this. Okay. Real close. Wait, let's move this over. Now. Close. <laughs> Hold it. There. Okay. Um, one of the qualities that I really appreciate about my dad that I don't really have in my life but um, is boldness. And um, I'm sure all of you have noticed that because he's not ashamed of the gospel, as it says in um, Romans 1.16. And that's evidenced by his t-shirts that he has all the time that have different slogans so that he can, from that, lead into the gospel. That's evidenced by the bumper stickers that we constantly had on our cars, honk if you love Jesus, and so people will honk at us all the time. And um, it's also evidenced by one of the messages that I've heard many times where he comes out and he yells that he wants to be a fool for Jesus, and who's fool are you? And then constantly when we were traveling um, cross country, he would have his wad of four spiritual laws or five keys to give to every guest attendant and everyone and so that's really um, a quality that he is constantly standing alone another one is his generosity and um, he's one to bring home people all the time for dinner so mom would um, put some more water in the soup or something and um, <laughs> All the, um, whenever street people come to the church, he's usually the one that's out there talking to them and seeing what he can do to um, meet their needs. And he's always the one that wants to go down to the worst part of Mexico with, you know, no toilet practically and no water and so that he can minister to people like that. And he, he has shown me um, that he gives unconditionally to people that can't give in return. So I appreciate those. Then, then in 1958, he really had a longing to work at a local church ministry, and uh, he was kind of phasing out of Campus Crusade for Christ, and so he decided to find a uh, church that had a Bob Jones graduate as a pastor. So he called back to, um, to Bob Jones to find out, you know, where is there a pastor in the L.A. area that is a Bob Jones grad? And he ran in to this man. Jerry, I remember you came into my office shortly after I'd become pastor of Temple Baptist Church in Fullerton. And I was impressed by you. You were well dressed. Uh, you were athletic, I just felt. And the most important thing was I sensed a real spiritual intensity about you. And we were not able at that time to take on a full-time youth pastor, but I thought of a friend of mine who was pastoring in San Diego at a church called Scott Memorial Baptist Church. And here's about what happened that day in 1958 when I called Pastor LaHaye. Hello. Hello, Tim. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Art calling. How well, you doing? Hi. How you doing up there? Well, we're doing great. Listen, what I'm calling you about was uh, there was a guy that uh, came in to see me the other day looking for a, a job as a youth pastor, and he heard uh, that I was here and from uh, BJ, and, and uh, we're not able to have anybody. We can't afford to have anybody at this time, but um, I thought maybe you might be interested in him. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, uh, we are. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking for a youth man. What kind of a guy is he? Well, he's a, a real uh, sharp guy. He's a um, graduate of BJ, and he's... Well, he can't be all bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he's had some uh, good experience with Campus Crusade and has a real mm -hmm. love for the Lord and a love for souls. I, I kind of sense he's a terrific soul winner. Great. Has he had any youth... Uh, uh, pastor experience? Well, I think uh, not. Uh, as far as I know, he's worked with uh, a lot of young people at Campus Crusade, but uh, I think he would do well. 
Well, uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up right now because uh, we've just finished the gymnasium here. Uh huh. And it was so interesting, uh, even though we had uh, auditorium needs, so we have to have two services in the morning to accommodate everybody. And uh, yet the people didn't even think about building an auditorium. They wanted to build a gymnasium. Mm hmm. Uh, it seems like a number of years ago they had some woman here that uh, was the youth sponsor or something. And yeah. She ran the high school and college age young people, and and during that time, God called a number of young people into the ministry and mm -hmm. uh, to the mission field, and they always look at that as the golden days of this church. Yeah. And uh, so, as we talked about adding to our staff and growing uh, our church, uh, one of the first things they mentioned was that they wanted a strong youth ministry. In fact, I'll be honest with you; I think that. The reason they were interested in me at 30 years of age was because they thought having a young pastor might spark a, a young uh, a youth ministry, and so they wanted to have a youth pastor. Right. Well, that's, that sounds uh, really good. Well, listen, I tell you what. I'll, uh, uh, the guy's name is Jerry Reif. Jerry Reif. That sounds like a box of cereal. <laughs> no, no, it's R-I-F-F-E. And he's got a real sweet little wife. And uh, she from Bob Jones too. Uh, she was there. They were both there, I think, in seminary, if I'm Great. remember. But what I'll do is I'll have him come down there and get in touch with you, and you can chat with him and see what you think. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. Just give him my number and uh, have him call me real soon because uh, uh, we're going to get serious about this, and I'd like to interview him myself and then have him meet some of the people in the church. Fantastic. Well, listen, are you coming up Tuesday for our study with Dr. Cook? Oh, yeah. i got to get another sermon up. <laughs> Have you got a good one for me? Well, I'll, I'll give you one when you get here. Okay. Hey, listen. And, and remember this, Art, whatever secret thing you have in your life, get it straightened out so the Lord can bring you to San Diego, okay? <laughs> I will really do that. It's fun to have you here. I need some fresh air. God bless. Hey, thanks, thanks for calling. Okay, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So in 1958, November 1st, Pastor Jeremiah Reif was hired at Scott Memorial Baptist Church. What I think might be fun, if we could have the house lights, just to see how many of you were there or around at that time that remember when Jerry came. Can you stand up if you were there in 1958? Isn't that exciting? That's great. Um, shortly after he arrived, it seemed like every time he got a new position, he had more children. <laughs> and uh, on April 18th, 1959, Jerusha was born. So if Jerusha and Dale, if you'll come up here. <laughs> Jerusha, we have a question for you. Look, at she's got her notes already, I tell you. <laughs> I'm going to change the question. No. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Now, Jerusha and I almost grew up together. She's a few years younger than us, but, um, or than me. But there was one thing about Jerry's daughters is that everyone was afraid to date them. Not because of them, because of him. They knew that they'd have to go to Bill Gothard 13 times, you know. And, uh, and so I asked Jerusha, I said, Jerusha, would you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be the daughter of Jerry? As I was thinking of, an of answering that question, I was reminded of a monologue I read several years ago. And it was about the meanest mother. And so I've taken the liberty to make a few changes and dedicate that to my dad. So. <laughs> I had the meanest father in the whole world. While other kids were having candy for breakfast, I had to have oatmeal and eggs and whole wheat bread. <laughs> <laughs> While other kids... <laughs> true. While other kids had Coke and candy for lunch, I'd have peanut butter and honey sandwiches. And of course, as you know, my suppers were different too. 
but at least I wasn't alone in my suffering. My three other sisters had to have the same mean father as I did. <laughs> my father insisted on knowing where we were at all times. You'd think we were on a chain gang. He had to know why, where, who our friends were and where we were doing and where we were going and what we were doing. And he insisted that if we said we'd be gone in, for one hour, we would be gone for one hour and, or less, and not one hour and one minute. <laughs> and I'm nearly ashamed to admit it, but he actually spanked us. Not once, but every time we did something that displeased him. Can you imagine actually hitting a child just because he disobeyed? <laughs> Now you can actually see how mean he, actually, he really was. He, um, by the time we were teenagers, he was much wiser, and our life was more unbearable. None of this tooting of the horn um, of a car for us to come running. He embarrassed us by making our friends and dates come to the door and get us. And I forgot to mention, while my friends were dating at the mature age of 12 and 13, we, had to date, we couldn't date until we were 16 and 18. 16, that is, if we were double dating, and you know what a hassle that is. My father was a complete failure as a father. None of us have ever been arrested, divorced, beaten by our mate. And who do we have to blame? No one but our father. You're right, my mean dad. Well, look at the things we missed. We didn't march in a protest parade or took part in a riot. We were never kicked out of school or busted on drugs. He forced us to grow up as God-fearing, educated, honest adults. Actually, I did kind of feel that way sometimes. Um, <laughs> I didn't actually appreciate um, some of the things I had to go through, like dressing according to modesty rather than maybe the style, or um, engaging in wholesome activities rather than maybe questionable ones. And also, of course, having my dates have to meet my father. I remember the line we had to memorize was, I appreciate you asking me, but you'll have to talk to my dad first. So... <laughs> Actually, it was a pretty good way to keep the flakes away, so. <laughs> and it did work. The right one did come around, and I'm thankful for everything I had to go through, because I had the very best. So thanks, Dad, for being the meanest dad. I love you. Then Jerry started his first, first youth group. And so if any of you are out there tonight that were in the first youth group, that's about 1960-ish to 1965, we'd love for you to come up here and sit on the, uh, in the choir loft with all the rest of us so that he can see uh, some of his early fruits. And we've asked three of those people if they'll share tonight. Oh, fruits. I didn't mean that. I didn't. Now no one will come. Now come on, come on. Uh, um, and three people from those uh, early years, so I'm going to call your name, you better come, um, is Don Taylor, Bob Bradford, and Linda Rainey, if you'll come up here. The Apostle Paul tells us that those who minister to us were to hold in the highest regard and love for their work. I think the Lord knew I would find the theologians at school, the Calvins, the Beezas, the Melanchthons. God knew I needed someone to model godliness and holiness for me. The three things I remember that Jerry did that were a model of holiness. First, in material things, uh, we were out calling one time after school on some young people who hadn't been coming to the group. We pulled up to the house and we said a word of prayer. And uh, Jerry turned the ignition key off and he just dropped it on the floor of the car. And I said, Jerry, somebody will steal the car. And he looked back at me and he says, well, don't worry about it. It's not important. <laughs> Materialism, one of the things he taught me about in modeling godliness. Hmm. One thing much more poignant, we were returning from uh, the desert. We'd been down at a TB sanitarium and we'd done a vacation Bible school there. And uh, one of the vehicles overheated. And I followed him into the garage to see if we could find a mechanic. And uh, this is like many garages, lots of uh, pictures on the wall that Christians don't look at. And uh, we walked in not knowing what was there. And Jerry looked up and he says, Don, the first time is temptation, the second time is sin. I watched him the whole time we were there. Never another eye was cast in that direction. Hmm. 
Jerry was modeling godliness and holiness. I've used this sermon illustration I don't know how many times Pastor Jerry, when he would come to greet me or others that were around the church grounds, big smile and he'd come almost running at you and he'd say, Isn't Jesus wonderful? And I was always, I, I, I knew as soon as Jerry was coming at me I had to pray because I couldn't say Jesus was wonderful if there was sin in my life. And Jerry is that constant encouragement to have that relationship with God, to love Him, and to learn to love holiness. Thank you, Jerry. Mm. <laughs> Pastor Jerry, I was born in this church, but more importantly, I'm a product of your life. You took me and the young people to Eutheramas around Southern California, Nyland and Calipatria, but the greatest impact you had in my life was every Wednesday night before prayer meeting, you met with us in a program called Powerhouse. Hmm. Remember the promises, the commands, and the summary of the chapter, and the ticklish questions. I'm in the ministry today as a direct result of your life. You gave me in those tender years an insatiable desire for the Word of God. You believed in your young people. I don't know what you saw in my life 24 years ago, but when I was 16 you asked me to preach what was to become my very first sermon. I had no idea that the Lord would call me to the ministry, but I preached my first sermon in Havasupai. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. I owe my ministry to the heritage I received from you. I was an unchurched teenager in the neighborhood and when I was nine I was invited by a friend where I found Christ here as my savior. I was twelve when Jerry Reif and Edie came to the church. They used to live right up the street in the alley, and I ate more sandwiches during the time that I knew the rives than I have in my whole life. <laughs> Peanut butter and tuna, but we had Bible studies with them and so much um, encouragement and direction. When I think of Jerry Rife, and I've thought long and hard the last three weeks about how in the world you say someone who in the major formation time of your thinking has directed you and given you the whole direction, what in the world do you say about Jerry and Edie? And I think the thing that is clearest to me is the simplicity of the man. Because it's Jesus is it, Jesus is all, Jesus is everything. There's no life, there is nothing apart from him. It's a black and white issue. It was never gray. It's never been gray since. Whatever he said stuck. It's always been fulfilling because he said that's all that there is. And Jerry, when I think of my life, I think where I could be. Life is so fragile. And I think the direction... Thank you. I know I'm the first one that was going to cry. They said, don't you dare. <laughs> but you know, you can't, you can't know people like the Rives and have that ministry in your life without thinking, where would I be if they went there? Thank you. Then in 1964, Ralph Radford and Tim LaHaye encouraged Jerry to go to jungle camp in Mexico. And so he went down to uh, Mexico for his first experience at jungle camp to see what missionaries had to go through to get prepared for the mission field. Jerry's never been the same after that because he had ins such an insatiable drive for missions. And that's where, when he started taking his uh, trips to Mexico with the high school kids. And one of the missionaries that uh, sent a tape back is one of our missionaries from South America, Alan Sue Graham, on the impact that Jerry's had in their life.
surprise, Terry. You didn't expect us to be here tonight, did you? It's just a real privilege to be here and be a part of This Is Your Life. And we would just like to say that we feel very privileged to have observed so much of your life and the influence that you've had on so many young people. We're impressed and we're influenced in our own lives by how much God's Word means to you and to your family. And you've been an encouragement to us and a challenge to go on so many times. We just pray that this meeting tonight will be a real blessing to you. And we would just like to say that this life of yours has been blessed and you have blessed others. And we know that God has many more things ahead of you. And even though this is your life, there's more to come. And uh, what all Sue said goes for me too, Jerry. I can never forget you because it was a certain thing that I, about you, Jerry, that uh, other people never treated me like you treated me. You always put faith in me. And uh, you gave me the young people and you used to always encourage me after I was through speaking and had done so poorly. You used to always say, give it to him. Now, keep giving it to him. You're doing great, guy. And uh, the young people that have come out of our church that have given their lives to the Lord Jesus to reach Bibleless, Christless tribes have been a, not only a result of you giving me those opportunities, but uh, your your also, also your desire that they go into this word. Well, may God bless you, and this is your life, Jerry Ryan. Then on November 5th, 1965, Shelley was born. And of course, Shelley can't be with us tonight, but she is here uh, in spirit, and we know that she's looking down from her heavenly home and rejoicing uh, about tonight. Then Jerry started with his next group of kids. I was going to say clump, and that's about what we were, because that's the group that I was with. And so if you were in that era, from 1965 through 1970-ish, if you would come up on stage, and to speak for that group, we had a guy fly in from back east, and you can't miss him. If you've ever seen him once, you can't miss this guy. Let's see if Jerry remembers his voice. Praise God, Edie! My son's coming home for dinner. Lots of water in the soup. <laughs> Without a, a Christian father to bring me up in Jesus Christ, Jerry Reif became my father. I can recall one particular occasion, Jerry, that uh, you pulled me in your office. You said, you're not living right, and you're not leaving my office till you get right with God. <laughs> I purpose to wait you out. Yeah, I did last about an hour, if I recall. The truth is, I really wanted to be right with Jesus Christ. That particular occasion, uh, among others that have come down from people that you challenged their lives, I think of Howard Taylor, who led me to Jesus, Don Taylor, who gave me a great opportunity to preach the first time, and his wife, because you touched their lives as well, have formed the basis uh, for my entire life and everything that I've ever done. And I would be willing at any time to stand by your side and hold your arms up like Moses' servants did to make sure that the water doesn't come back. Anybody else from that era, please come up and uh, sit with us on the platform. There's many of you. I saw you before the thing, so, uh, so come on up. Good. Steve McGrew. That's good to have you. Say, say your names as you come in, and then we can. Because some of you don't look the same. You look better, Carolyn. You look better. Hi, Sharon. 
Sally Henshaw? Oh. <laughs> Mike Blythe? That's great. Oh, these memories. This is ridiculous. And boy, we can tell some good stories. Uh, it reminded me of a story that... Um, when he was saying about the, the sayings that Jerry says. I remember one day out at, uh, out at Christian Heritage, Jerry came running through the aisles and he stuck his head into the uh, secretary's office and he says, Are you lusting after the Lord? <laughs> and they didn't know what to say. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. And... Uh, um, so he always kept you on your toes. You never knew. That's amazing. That's great. Well, then shortly, he started the Summer Servants Program in 1967 and touched many, many people's lives. And uh, then he started also teaching at Christian High School right here on this campus. And he taught basketball. And he touched many, many lives of the kids in basketball. In fact, one of my very best friends, uh, Red Balfour, I came to know the Lord when he started a basketball clinic. Uh, he'd, he'd go down to uh, um, Garfield or whatever that little school is down the street and pull kids out of there to play on the basketball team. And then at the basketball team, uh, he'd ask him about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And he received Christ when he was in elementary school um, because that's the kind of life that Jerry lived. But I asked a couple guys to come back tonight and share some experiences from those early years teaching at Christian High School on the basketball team. See if you remember these voices. Jerry, there's a few things I'll never forgive you for. One of them, I remember when CIF banned all basketball teams going to Lincoln High School and all black high school and playing basketball. You thought it was an opportunity for Christian High School to go play even though every other team that had gone there before us were beat up. We knew you weren't following the Spirit. <laughs> I'll forgive you for saying that I didn't win the wind sprint when the gentleman next to me, uh, when I really beat him, because you wanted us to keep running. But the one thing I won't forgive you for is I wanted to be a lot like you, and in my junior year, I got a buzz haircut, and I'll never forgive you for making me do that. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that Lincoln game also. Um, we got whipped up pretty bad. Every time we scored a basket, it was for Jesus. That was Lincoln team and the stands saying that their music was burned, but that's another subject. Um, the thing that I most remember you for was the day I quit. I went run We practiced next door here. I went running up the stairs, and this guy followed me. Grabbed my clothes away from me and said, you're not going anywhere. I said, yes, I am. The reason I quit was, and I don't know if you're here, Howard, so please forgive me. He told me I ran like Howard Nordine. <laughs> Dave Malcolm and Dan Kirby, that's great. Then, um, I'm sure from the Bill Gothard meetings or, or somewhere, G Jerry was inspired to multiply himself not only in sharing his faith, but in training other people to go into the ministry. And so he started the intern uh, program. And so, even as I look up here on the stage tonight, there's many uh, men and women that are in full-time Christian service because of the influence of Jerry Rife. But he even, uh, in his intern program, he started training them side by side with him, teaching them how to train others and um, see if you recognize one of your very first. Jerry always pushed us to go beyond what we thought we were capable of doing. In 1975, Jerry, I had started to work for Jerry just as a volunteer, and he said, uh, I'm going to Japan in two weeks and I'd like you to take over. <laughs> and that was way beyond what I could have done. Six months later, I was able to be the first intern here, the first um, full-time uh, paid intern to work alongside with Jerry. He pushed us and pushed us and pushed us to be more than we thought we could be, to be our best. The word quitter 
is the worst word in the vocabulary when you're working with Jerry. And I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad he's always pushed us beyond what we thought we could do. When I was in high school, um, he knew of an opportunity to go work out at Pine Valley. I'd never worked at a camp before. He said, Doug, this would be a good thing for you to do. You can do it. Go out there and be a counselor. So I worked at Pine Valley for a week back in 1970. And I'm so glad that Jerry's pushed me in that area. I'm now the, um, to his praise, I'm now the director of the largest summer camp in Oregon and thankful for the ministry, thankful for the family life that Jerry has modeled so that I can uh, have those kinds of things to follow after and to strive after. Jerry, you've been a father, you've been a, a pastor, you've been a really mean guy sometimes. <laughs> and the Lord knew that you were just what I needed. Thank you. And another one of yours. <laughs> Spit that gum out. I didn't, didn't know it until tonight, but I guess I was a second intern under Pastor Jerry. And, um, remember my first week there, uh, he was running around taking pictures and everything. And uh, about two weeks after I had started, uh, he came up to me with a picture. And he had me in a pose about like this. <clears throat> and I was chewing a piece of gum, and he... Uh, he showed me the picture and it really embarrassed me. He said, you shouldn't chew gum when you're in front of people. So before I got up here tonight, I, I spit out the gum. And uh, anyways, he, he blackmailed me with that picture. He threatened to give it to my girlfriend and to, you know, to everybody. And then, it, then he lost it and he thought I stole it. And I, honest, I never stole that picture. But um, the one thing about Jerry that most impressed me and the one thing that... Um, as I went to Dallas Theological Seminary, they couldn't teach me there. And that was living like Jesus Christ cannot be taught. It has to be caught. And the only way that you can really learn it is to get next to either the Lord Jesus or a man who's living and walking like the Lord Jesus. And that's what Jerry did for me. Is that he modeled everything that a Christian should be, a man of God should be. And that rubbed off on me and has given me great success, uh, uh, a really blessed family life, and, and, uh, and a ministry. And Jerry, I thank you very much. We have some early, early slides of some of... Uh, one thing you knew about Jerry, if you ever went on a trip, he never took a camera, ever. So these we had to pull and, and dig and find. But these are some early pictures of some of these kind of things that, that Jerry took us on. The bike hikes, youth aramas, Horton Plaza sharing down there, and it wasn't the new shopping center. <laughs> um, and at every retweet, we'd always have to memorize scripture before we could eat. Um, Loftus retreats, Grand Canyon trips, backpacking down to the Grand Canyon. Uh, trips to Mexico, and these are some of the services in Mexico. Another bike hike trip. Beach reaches on Friday nights. Trips to Utah. And uh, that's Bill Stallo, by the way, when he had hair. Uh, and Jerry taught us things that we couldn't believe, like sleeping out under the stars, washing our own clothes, washing other people's clothes when we did something wrong. Uh, <laughs> He taught us what it was to be a servant for other people. And the first time I ever saw Jerry cry was down in Mexico, and he had led uh, 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 the Mexican um, Jose to the Lord. And I saw Jerry just bawl out of joy seeing um, Jose come to know the Lord. This is, uh, many of you remember the desert safaris in the desert at the Valacita train station out there. And there's Jerry preaching in that uh, mud hut out there. And some of the, that's the, one of the earliest youth groups that we have record of. Always the best kitchen equipment. <laughs> and he would never let us complain about food. Look at that hunk, would you? Look at that hunk. Dennis Lorenz. So those are some early pictures. Notice the one in the middle, Rhonda Radford. Linda LaHaye over in the far corner. Youth Ramers, Felix Navarro, Mike Blythe. <coughs> <coughs>
I don't know who that is. <laughs> and Jerry always got the high school working with the younger people, and he always got the younger people. Murph. Is that Murph? Yeah. Oh, oh, and the infamous green van. <laughs> then Jerry always got his youth group always working with the senior citizens and had them adopt senior citizens and going to rest homes and singing Christmas carols at Christmas time to them at the rest homes. Then we'd break the uh, Christmas bulbs. And right there. So Jerry, thank you for those memories we will never, ever forget. Then, July 1971, Bethany Joy was born. So, Bethany, would you come up here? Now, your sisters said that I had to ask you a question, or it wouldn't be fair. But she doesn't have any notes. Do you want me to ask you a question? Oh, no. Okay. Okay. I won't, I won't embarrass you then. Have a seat. You want me to ask her a question? You can't quit now. Get her. All right. Are you nervous? Don't be nervous. Well, I better hold this for you because. If... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. Let's move it over here. Okay. Now, the question. What what memory do you remember most about your dad growing up? Okay. Because now you're you know you're in high school now and so what memory do you remember that really stands out in your mind about your dad at home? Okay. Do you remember something? That was at home, not about, not about going to camps or anything like that, but something at home. Um, just us having to... Um, no, no. It, <laughs> um, us having to wake up in the morning really early before we could do anything and have Bible study. That's right. That's great. <laughs> Praise God. That's right. <laughs> Then, in 1975, the church uh, gave Jerry and Edie a trip to uh, the Orient, to Japan and the Philippines. And this is a picture of Jerry when he was there. Now, Edie told me a story about this picture. Uh, Jerry was quite a skier when he was at UCLA, and he loved the sport. He loved skiing. Um, but after he came to know the Lord, uh, the Lord convicted him or something. He, the Lord's never convicted me of this, but... Um, <laughs> So I'm not sure it's the Lord. But anyway, he felt that it was just too expensive of a sport to spend that kind of money and that that kind of money should be going into missions and helping people. So since he was in college, he had never skied from that point on. He got rid of his skis and everything until he went to Japan. And so when he was away, the cats will play. And, uh, <laughs> and he got up on skis again when he went to Japan where he knew no Scott Memorial people would see him. <laughs> And then uh, in 1979, we sent him on a trip to Europe to visit some of our missionaries. And uh, we have a tape from two of those missionaries, the Myers and the Bentners. So listen to their message to Jerry. Hi, Pastor Jerry. I send you greetings from Cologne, West Germany. This is Craig Meyer speaking. And I'm glad to have a part in the program honoring you for 30 years of service at Scott Memorial Baptist Church because I also am a part of your ministry for the Lord. I still remember that Sunday night very clearly in June 1960 when I walked forward as the invitation was given to receive Christ. Jerry came forward, grabbed my hand, gave me a hearty squeeze and took me to his office where I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior. Immediately after this, you started giving me some books to read to strengthen my newfound faith. But I noticed that most of these books that you gave me were missionary books with a very strong missionary message in them. It was those books, plus traveling with you, Jerry, to Mexico for the summer weekends, especially preaching to the people living in the Tijuana dump, that influenced my life 
to make a decision to serve the Lord as a missionary overseas. Even after I started attending Moody Bible Institute, I was encouraged by the letters that you wrote to me and the occasional gifts that you sent. By this, I knew that the people at Scott Memorial were behind me in my decision to serve the Lord as a missionary. And I still remember those good times we had together meeting in the basement of the old sanctuary building for a special discipleship training class. Those times together have set a pattern that I still use in my ministry amongst the Turkish people in Germany. My wife Susan is here with me and you remember that you had something to do with us getting together too. And I'd like to let her tell you about it. Hi Jerry, this is Susan. Do you remember our wedding on October 15th in 1966? It was scheduled for 7 o'clock in the evening, but you came late. Poor Jim DeSager had to play Here Comes the Bride three times, each time a little bit louder. But I couldn't start down the aisle because you and Craig wouldn't come out of the side door up front. Finally, Craig's brother crawled out on his hands and knees behind that little red curtain in front of the organ and called up to Jim, Hey, the preacher's late. But when you finally did get there, you tied the knot real good. You preached from Ephesians 5, I can still remember. And Craig and I are still together and praising the Lord for our, our life, our joint life and serving him. I also remember when you and Edie came over to Europe a few years ago and visited us in Cologne. Remember you couldn't get that gas stove to work in your new camper? You came over there looking like an American with those American shorts on, but the Lord had provided. A German neighbor had just given us a pair of beautiful wool gray walking shorts and we passed them on to you. They fit you perfectly. We went out and got some long knee socks and you set off for the rest of your trip looking like a, a typical German but with a crew cut. <laughs> Jerry, we love you. God bless you. I'll sign off for Craig, Susan, Andrew, now 12 years old, and Jessica, now 11. Bye. Jerry and Edie, greetings from France, from your friends, long lost friends, Mel and Jan Bittner. We're delighted to be able to have this privilege of sending greetings to you because you've been an inspiration to us. You've been an, an inspiration to me through the years. As a friend and as a minister in the gospel, you've taught people how to run the race, the race that's set before them, laying aside every weight and you've desired honesty and sanctification in the life. I just wish, Jerry, that we were able to sit down and talk about old times. Talk about ministry. Talk about the way God's blessed. And I want to thank you for having encouraged Jan and me to attend the basic youth conflict seminar many many years ago we never heard of the, the seminar and you said we ought to go and we went and the group that you see on the screen is a group that we took the very first time to a youth seminar basic youth seminar in Switzerland at Lausanne held by a French person, actually a Swiss person, with the permission of Bill Gothard. And it has been a blessing, and it has been a blessing to our people. And Jerry, thank you for having made that suggestion. And we want to congratulate you, and we want to praise the Lord for 30 years of faithful service there in the ministry at Scott. May God bless you. Jerry, many other people have sent tapes, but we don't have time tonight to go through them all, but we're giving them to you afterwards, and um, I'm sure in your way home you can listen to them in your cassette if you've bought one. Um, <laughs> but Dottie Donnelly, Becky Briggs, Jeff uh, Finro, Deck Flayton, Flayton has all sent tapes, and we want to give them to you. Then on June 5th, Jerry has been such a family man, and he's committed... At, I, I mean, his, his daughters are so feminine and so beautiful and so... And look at him. I mean, he's... 
and, and, uh, and I remember on June 5th, 1982, Jerusha got married. And I remember him coming down the aisle and uh, holding her hand and saying, I'm a rich man. I'm a rich man. <laughs> to everybody that uh, was there in the aisle. And uh, Jerry, you truly are a rich man. You have a beautiful, beautiful family. Then a tragedy happened, at least most people would consider it a tragedy, on December 27th, 1982, down in Mexico, Shelley, his daughter, was taken home to be with the Lord in a bus accident. And it was a terrible tragedy for the whole church, and we all weeped, and we all um, went through real pain and suffering. But we saw a man and a woman go through a terrible ordeal like this with such victory and holding his head high and praising God throughout the whole thing. And it wasn't a new thing to our church because it had happened once before at a Colorado River trip on a ski trip. And so tonight we asked um, Fred and Dottie, if they, uh, Betty, if they would share um, and how Jerry was used in their life with a similar accident. Jerry needs the harvest is plenty but the laborers are few. I know Pastor Jerry prays that a laborer would be one of you. A tourist may come and they may go. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, taking pictures, click, click, and shopping from store to store. Click, click. He's a left an impression. He's a left an impression that's here to stay. I know we're running a little bit late, but Jerry, you're worth it. Um, That's right. Then in nine, uh, I, I remember Jerry has always been a very committed family man, but I remember we, uh, the, in the very early years of the Bill Gothard ministry, Jerry piled us into his van, I, and that's where I got to know my wife. <laughs> so I don't mean like that. I mean, I got to know my wife. And... Um, and Noreen Mc, uh, McPherson at that time, and Mike Blythe, and a few others would just take a van up to Biola College, and that's when you could stop Bill Gothard in the middle of a sentence and say, excuse me, but I don't understand at this point that you're going over, and that was a long, long time ago. You didn't see him on a screen. But I remember um, after that meeting that Jerry changed dramatically at home. And not that I lived with him or anything, but I saw that his commitment to the family was really uh, drastically changed. And Jerry, you have been an inspiration to me raising my family that I know because Cheryl says many times, well, Pastor Jerry doesn't do it that way, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so uh, I want to thank you for being a model. And they say there's no heroes today. That's not true. Jerry is a hero and he is a model and we love him. And we have a few of the family pictures um, of his family. These are some throughout the years. An early picture. The van. And there's Shelley. That's at the Reed's home. You can see the dishes. And there's the complete family together. <laughs> that was Edie's new dress, Jerry Trudeau. So Jerry, 
we want to thank you for being a very special person in every one of our lives. I'm not going to have the youth groups of the um, 70s and 80s come up here because practically the whole group would come up. But I also remember one time I asked Jerry, Jerry, who is your best friend? And he said, Jesus. And I said, no, no, come on now, be real now. Uh, and he'd always say Jesus. And I said, but if you had to pick an earthly friend that's on this earth, who would be your best friend? And he said, well, I, I, guess, uh, I guess this voice. Jerry, what a great blessing to watch your life for over 25 years and see you look like that verse in uh, 2 Corinthians 15:58. Thou art steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And it's just been great for me and my family to watch you and Edie and, and just uh, see that you have been faithful all these years. And as we examined your life, the committee examined your life, we found that your fruit has remained. And we're just so blessed and encouraged just by contacting the people that we have. And it's been exciting. And we just love you, Jerry. Appreciate it. I also want to acknowledge Bill and his wife. They planned this entire thing, did all the research, got the slides together. And Pastor Peters is going to sing my favorite song, We've Come This Far By Faith. Before I do, I'd like to say just a word. You know, I never dreamed in 1958 when Tim and I talked about Jerry Rife that I would ever be here as pastor of this church. And for years, Tim would kid me about coming to San Diego and getting a breath of fresh air. But you know, we have come this far by faith. And as I look at all of these people on this platform tonight, I think of what Paul said to the Corinthians. He says, you are our epistle, known and read of all men. And I think that's true. These are epistles to the glory of God that Jerry Reif has done a lot of writing on. Amen. Come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in His holy word. He's never failed us yet. Oh, oh, oh we can't turn back. We've come this far by faith. Don't Discouraged with trouble in your life, he'll bear your burdens and move all discord and strife. We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. He's never failed us yet. Oh, we can't turn back. We've come this far by faith. Just remember those good things He has done. Things that seem impossible. Oh, praise Him for the victories He has won. We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in His holy word. He's never failed us yet. Oh, oh, oh we can't turn back. We've come this far by faith. We've come this far by faith. Thank you.
You know, we wouldn't be here tonight celebrating this wonderful occasion if it hadn't been for one man who was committed to sharing Jesus Christ on the campus of UCLA years ago. I'd like to introduce that man and have him come to the pulpit again tonight, the founder and director of Campus Crusade for Christ, Dr. Bill Bright. Bill? Jerry, Edie, we're here tonight to celebrate with you and your family. Jerry Rife, this is your life. Because we love you. There is a verse of scripture that I believe describes the life of this one whom we honor tonight, who by his life and ministry honors our Lord. It is Romans 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, makes this statement. Dear friends in Rome, this letter is from Paul, Jesus Christ's slave, chosen to be a missionary, sent out to preach God's good news. When I think of Jerry Rife, I think of the Apostle Paul. I know he will probably cringe at the thought. But you see him as I see him, a man who, like the Apostle Paul, knew the reality of Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When I think of Jerry, I think of his commitment to the word of God. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of God dwell in your heart richly. When I think of Jerry, I think of Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. I think of Jerry... When I think of the Apostle Paul identifying himself with Christ, the living Savior, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, he speaks of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then, as a result of this glorious realization, he says, everywhere I go, I tell everyone about Christ. I talk about Christ to everyone who will listen. Jerry Rife. A slave of Christ, crucified with Christ, buried and raised with Christ, a man of the word, a man of the spirit, who is constrained by that same love that sent the apostle Paul forward to tell everyone who will listen about Christ. In addition, I think of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul admonished his son in the faith, Timothy, the things that you've heard from me commit to faithful men also, who will in turn pass on the good news to others. A disciple of men. One who has learned to rejoice with Paul in tribulations and sorrow, heartache, and disappointments in all things to give thanks to praise God even through tears with broken heart I remember my first meeting with Jerry those first weeks and months from the very beginning he was one of those unique men who had a heart for God we had a staff conference up in the mountains, in San Bernardino. And we were talking about the importance as a staff of being models, that we might be perceived as godly men and women. Nothing that we might do would be interpreted as being a compromise. Sometimes at a party, 
a fraternity or sorority gathering, while others are drinking, be sure you're not drinking something that looks like alcohol. Drink out of a, a Coca-Cola bottle or a glass of orange juice or something. And don't go to dances and, and uh, be involved in doing things that might be questionable. I remember Jerry was just listening in. I don't remember how he happened to be there, but he wanted in on everything that had to do with spiritual growth. And when he came, when after the meeting, he came to me and he said, if these things are wrong, I don't want to do them anymore. And Jerry was quite a man on the campus, popular in the fraternity world, big man on campus. From the very beginning, I sensed him in him a heart for God. And through the years, he has demonstrated that he is a slave of Jesus Christ. I can't think of any greater privilege than any of us could know. But unfortunately, as I view the body of Christ all over the world, there aren't many slaves. There are a lot of people who say, I'm a follower of Christ, or I believe in Christ. They're good church members, even elders and deacons. But they're like a man who is very famous. All of you would know his name. I went to see him some time ago. I heard he was a Christian. He had been the governor of a state. He had been a member of the cabinet of two presidents. He is a man of great influence. Brilliant. Incredibly powerful man. I heard he was a Christian. And so I went to ask him to join with a group of other men of like ability and like commitment to help change the world for Christ. And he cut me off very sharply. He's a man of such strength that one doesn't deal with casual things with him. And he said, I am a Christian, but I'm not a fanatic. I don't wear my religion on my sleeve. It's personal and private, and I don't talk about it. That was the end of the conversation as far as he was concerned. But I felt impressed to pursue it, and I said, sir, I don't want to offend you. You say you're a Christian. Yes. I said, did it ever occur to you that it cost the Lord Jesus Christ his life? He died on the cross for you, to, for your sins, in order for you to say you're a Christian. Did it ever occur to you that the disciples died as martyrs getting this message through to you? All of them died as martyrs except John who was boiled in oil after being persecuted for his faith and exiled to the Isle of Patmos. It ever occur to you that through the centuries, Christians have been persecuted by the millions and multitudes have died getting this message through to you so you could call yourself a Christian? Now let me ask you, do you really think your Christianity is personal and private and you shouldn't talk about it? He said, no sir, I'm wrong. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. There are a lot of people like this man who have not been confronted with the fact that true Christians are really slaves of Jesus Christ. The reason we're here to honor Jerry Wright tonight is because he determined years ago that he wouldn't Mickey Mouse around about Jesus. He wouldn't play games with Jesus. He wouldn't just be a good religious youth leader and teach the young people how to sing happy songs. But he would call them to the Lordship of Christ. And that's the reason so many are out serving Christ in the pulpits and in other parts of the world. I conclude my remarks tonight with this word to all of us. Are you a slave of Jesus Christ? Or are you just a good church member? This is one of the great churches of this community. It's been known through the years as a Bible preaching pulpit. Then you hear the word of God here. Preached with authority and power and you have for a long time that I'm aware of. But I know that even people in the most conservative fundamental churches can listen and not be transformed. They can follow Christ at a distance like this man. As long as it doesn't follow up my life, I will follow Christ. But I have my own plans. And I remember when Jerry said to me, he was a dreamer. He had plans. He wanted to travel around the world. He said, I have my own plans. And he said, I'm afraid if I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, he may change my plans. And I said, I hope so. 
because you're a puny little termite of a person, a finite creature. You don't po couldn't possibly know the incredible challenge God has for you. He created the heavens and the earth. He established the laws that govern the whole of creation. He has a wonderful, joyful, exciting, beautiful plan for you that you'd never discover if you tried to figure it out on your own. And Jerry saw the logic of that, and we bowed together, and he received Christ. What joy for, my, for, for me. What joy to see him grow. And what joy to see him become a slave of Christ. And not only demonstrate the crucified, spirit-filled life, a man of the word, a man who witnesses, a man who disciples, a man who gives thanks in all things, but one who has taught others to do the same, producing other slaves after the order of the Apostle Paul. Let me close with this illustration. I was in Rome some years ago. I had the privilege of visiting a dungeon cell where the Apostle Paul was incarcerated some months before his martyrdom. I remember kneeling alone in that dirty dungeon cell, not known to the public, and very few tourists go there. I was deeply moved because apart from my Savior, the Lord Jesus, whom I love with all my heart, the Apostle Paul has inspired me all these years since I've become a Christian, since I've been a Christian. <clears throat> He's been dead almost 2,000 years, and yet he, more than any person, apart from Jesus, continues to inspire me daily as my example, my model. So I knelt there in that dirty dungeon cell and worshipped the Lord whom he worshipped, incarcerated, chained to centurion guards from Caesar's household, and they changed them according to tradition every two hours for fear they'd get converted. And they did. The gospel went back into the throne room of the Caesars from that cell. And I asked God to do something deeper in my own life. That evening, I was privileged to go across the road to the Roman Forum, where for almost a thousand years, the center of world commerce and trade and government was focused, the Roman Forum. Here was the scene through the light and sound that portrayed the drama of ancient Rome. Here the senators gathered to legislate the laws that governed that Roman Empire. Here the conquering generals came to report their victories and receive their applause. In this Roman forum, Julius Caesar was assassinated. The forum reeked with drama. I've always enjoyed Roman history. And so that night I was especially enthralled as I sat there. And then suddenly I was awakened as if out of a, out of a, a dream. To be reminded that what God had done in the life and through the life of that man in the dungeon cell across the road, a few feet, hundred feet away from the forum, has accomplished more for the good of mankind than all that the Caesars and the senators and the great leaders and generals of Rome have produced. For unless one is a student of Roman history, the names of the Caesars are long since forgotten. But the name of the Apostle Paul lives on inspiring men even to this very hour all over the world why because he was a slave of Christ he had made a total irrevocable commitment to Christ in response to our Lord's command if any man come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me and if any man comes after me, as Peter inquired, Lord, we've given up everything to follow you. What about us? And Jesus said, no man can give up houses and lands and brothers and sisters and mother and father in, without receiving in this life a hundred times over what he gives up. 
the life which we celebrate tonight is a good testimony of that. When you return home tonight, may I suggest you turn to the flyleaf of your Bible. If you've never done this, inscribe on the flyleaf of your Bible the date and words similar to these, but let them be your own from your own heart. Lord Jesus Christ, following the example which you demonstrated, for you were always doing that which pleased the Father. And the example of the Apostle Paul, who was your slave, I tonight become a slave, your slave. From henceforth, I want to be the kind of person who will have an impact for your glory as long as I live. And I can assure you, though you may be a person of wealth or fame or, or great influence, there will never be anything you will ever do that will be more important than that decision. Becoming a slave of Christ is the most liberating experience one can ever know. My wife and I did that literally with a contract, signing a contract 36 years ago this spring. And I can tell you, these 36 years of incredible drama, adventure, are beyond words to describe. And I always rejoice when I meet men and women who are true slaves of Christ. Jerry, Edie, your beloved family, we love you because you're a slave of Christ without a policy. Let's bow in prayer. Holy Father, examine each of our hearts tonight. And may many slaves be born. Men and women who've been ordinary Christians, professing with lips but not with lives, your Lordship. May there be reality and revolution resulting from commitments that will be made tonight to crown you Lord and Master and King, never to turn back. Always to follow you. King of kings and Lord of lords, whatever it costs us, as your slaves. And we offer our praise and our worship and adoration to you in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And especially tonight, we thank you for our beloved brother, Jeremiah Rife, and his precious wife, Edie, and their children and grandchildren, and all who are dear to them, his dear mother. We thank you for them. And for the model that demonstrates again, as in the life of the Apostle Paul, how you use men who are truly, and women who are truly your slaves. Grant it for your own glory and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bright. I know that all of us deeply appreciate your being with us tonight and taking time to be here. And as I looked over this congregation here tonight, you know, I've been around this place for 17 years. That's a long time. And I looked out over all of your faces tonight and I remember just about all of you and just about where you used to sit when this all began here before it became one church or in three locations. And as Dr. Bright was talking tonight, I thought there may be some of us who have been a part of this ministry through the years that have found that our love is waxing cold, it's waning, it isn't like it used to be. We don't have the warm spiritual heart that we once had. There's a coldness and there's a deadness inside. I hope you'll go home and you will write down in the flyleaf of your Bible this commitment. This could be a time of fantastic renewal in your own life. Maybe you've lost your first love. 
But you know, Roman, a revelation says, remember from whence you have fallen and do the first works. And you'll be surprised that God will stir your heart and renew your heart. We thank God for what he's done in these ministries. Seventy-five years ago it began right here. Launched out into east, then north. And you know, regularly I pray for those folks out east and those folks up north. Three independent churches now that all started right here. Thank God for what he's done and what he's going to do. Now I'd like to just take another minute and recognize all of the folks on the 75th anniversary committee. Would you just stand up where you are right now? You've had a great deal to do with what's happening here tonight. Alan Reed, our chairman in the back, and, and uh, George Hahn, and these folks all around here. Let's give them a hand, okay? Chuck Bennett, Lois Stallow, and then Chuck West is responsible for the 75th anniversary tape, which we have for sale. If you'd like to find out the history of this place, you uh, let us know and we'll see that you get one of those tapes. Now, I could go on, but I'm not going to do it. Because it's time for us to be dismissed into our gymnasium in just a moment where we're going to enjoy fellowship with one another and we're going to enjoy some refreshments. But before we go... Jerry, would you like to say just a few words? <laughs> Not a long one now, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and truly really a blessing. Uh, the verse I, I think if you, when you remember me, these are the verses I like for you to remember, is uh, John 12. I should have memorized and I'm afraid I'll choke here. Uh, John 12, 24 to 26. It says, uh, except a corn of wheat. Let's see. I know, I can't eat, man. Truly, truly, Jesus is talking now, so listen. I say to you, unless a corn of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life, loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If any man serves me, the Father will honor him. Those verses are the ones that, uh, those when I went prayed in my life, you know. Because there's only fruit if you're willing to die for Jesus Christ, you know. Appreciate uh, my dad here talking to me, talking, because it was great that uh, he came. And I remember, he's the one that taught me the most, but being concerned about Jesus Christ, sharing Christ with others, how to be filled with the Spirit, all these uh, central things that are really basic to a Christian's life. Let's just have a word of prayer. And Father, we, we thank you for Jesus Christ. And Father, uh, Americans today are so, we, so Mickey Mouse. And uh, we, just, uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, we'll be serious about Jesus Christ. We'll commit our life, and just as our bill has said, that we might be willing to be a slave of Christ. And um, we thank you for this evening. We do want it to bring glory and honor to Christ. And thank you, Father, for um, the good time we've had. And it's, just, it's, it's exciting to just serve you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Why don't we... Um, uh, Jerry, when he came back from Mexico, taught the whole congregation a song. Why don't we stand and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. That's the song he taught us all in 1965. <laughs> Does someone know how to play that? Do you know? <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Oh, none go with me.
there's another verse <laughs> you know I'm sure I speak for the Rifes to thank all of you from the depths of our hearts that you were here tonight thank God you came and some of you are in different places serving God right now some out of town some in different cities some here in San Diego one thing I hope you'll do is you'll remember us right here in this home place that God will continue to stir our hearts and use us in these coming days for his glory in an even greater way than we could ever dream you're dismissed right now to go next door to the gym where there's refreshments and fellowship awaiting. Oh, we, we'd like to ask all of the people to be sure to pick up your wonderful children out of the nursery right away.